And we're going to read that now. That's page 855 uh, in your pew Bibles. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he'll save his people from their sins." Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they'll name him Emmanuel, which is translated God is with us. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Keep your Bibles open there. Uh, if you've got a sermon out, uh, a newsletter and you like to take notes, sermon outline there inside that, a uh, brief map of where we're going. And uh, if there's an opportunity at the end, uh, there might be a chance for some questions. Uh, one of the things that surprises me every year is Christmas. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but at least in theory, I know it happens on the same date every year. Uh, and my pattern of preparation usually falls into the chaos basket. Uh, other people are far more disciplined. Uh, some of us are a little more organised and begin our Christmas shopping on Boxing Day of the year before, don't we? Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, some of us start a little closer to the date and then there's people like me and we think, oh, well, three weeks, plenty of time. In each of our households, there are also certain traditions, aren't there? Certain things we do as a household. Uh, one of the most common across every household is the pattern of being together, gathering with loved ones, close friends and family for Christmas. Uh, in many households, that can take a pattern of year about, with a family moving to different places and homes to be together. As I was growing up, Christmas Day would be with this family, Boxing Day with that family and the leftovers the day afterwards. Uh, some use the season to care for those who are outsiders, people who might be on their own or lonely, to welcome and provide for those who've missed out. Uh, for many of us, being together is the tradition of Christmas, isn't it? Christmas is about presence. Sometimes that delight of being together, of the goodness of presence, fails, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes that might be through illness. Sometimes a loved one will not be there because of death. It might be stopped because of conflict or hostility. And often when those fractures and absences happen, we might, as God's mob, be prompted to ask a deeper question. Where is God at a time like this? In an environment of being together on this one day of the year amidst all of that commercial hype and profit, we might ask that question, where is God, to confront the world around us, mightn't we? And why they celebrate Christmas. Or we might ask that question in a searching way, wondering whether God would actually want to come and spend Christmas with us, whether he could spend Christmas with us, whether he actually has that desire. We might ask that question in lament, because we look at the world around us and go, where is God in all of this? Or we might ask that question in a more aggressive way, dismissing the relevance of God and his place not just at Christmas but in our own lives. However we ask that question at Christmas, where is God? The answer is going to be connected to an even deeper issue we struggle with, even if we don't know we struggle with it. And that's the issue of sin. You see, sin is at the heart of that question, where is God? And Christmas is the time when that question and issue are placed front and centre. We're going to look at that today. Let me pray. 
Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that it does raise questions. I thank you that at this time of the year it can raise deeper questions about your presence in the world, uh, whether you even want to be connected to this world or even with people. Father, thank you that it causes us to go even deeper into our hearts and minds, uh, into the very bones and marrow of our existence. Father, we pray that today as we read a very familiar account, you'll raise that question with us, you'll raise the deeper issue with us, and we'll see your great desire to be with your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Advent, uh, this period in the church calendar, uh, is a period of roughly four weeks leading up to Christmas. Uh, It's the period that catches the idea of waiting or arriving. Uh, In in this period of the year, uh, God's mob have traditionally spent time looking over their shoulder backwards and looking forwards. Uh, They look backwards at the first coming of Jesus, and we've just heard the beginning of that account, haven't we, from Matthew. And they look forwards to the return of Jesus because he came once and he's coming again. Uh, This year we're going to do it by looking at Matthew's biography of Jesus. Uh, And in Matthew's biography, there are four references that look backwards so that you're ready for what's coming in front of you. And we're going to look at a different one each week. Um, At point two on the Alan Matthews opening section, uh, the section that everyone is thankful they don't have to do as a Bible reading, uh, actually lays the foundation for God's preparation and helps us understand that God's been getting ready for this day for a very, very long time. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, This is not a new story. Uh, We miss it in our translations, uh, but that word, or those words, historical record, in the Greek literally are Genesis. How long has God been getting ready for this moment? Since chapter 1, verse 1 of the Bible. Since even before that, since Genesis. This is the genesis of Jesus Christ. This is the latest, greatest, biggest chapter in that work of God. It's the key chapter. And at the heart of that are promises. Did you see the way Jesus is described there? I've never seen that in the birth notices of a local paper. The historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There's a promise to a bloke called Abraham way back in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Abraham, through your mob... I'm going to actually deal with the brokenness of this world. I'm going to remove the judgment of sin and through your mob, Abraham, I'm going to hang out with my people again. Uh, It's a promise to deal with the key issue that every human being faces and commits. That's the key issue of sin, isn't it? The attitude and action that says I'm God and God's not. Even simpler definition has got I in the middle. Sin separates humans from God. Sin separates humans from each other. Sin separates humans and sets them against the world they live in because it's under God's judgment. And God says, I'm going to do something about that because I want to live with my mob. I'm going to do it through Abraham's family. There's the promise to David. That's from a book in the Bible called 2 Samuel. That's chapter 7 where God says... In all this chaos of the world, I'm going to bring a bloke who's going to rule in peace. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great to have peace? Not just quietness, but peace, restoration, justice, mercy. And God says through David's family, I'm going to bring that about. Those two promises come together at this moment. They're an expression of God's grace. I am committed to a world that's turned its back on me in an unrelenting, merciful and kind way. Both of those promises are an expression of faith. As we come to the next few verses, you don't need good deeds, you don't need good behaviour, you don't even need an impeccable family tree. You've just got to trust that God can do as he promised. And all of those promises come together in one bloke. Do you see how there's a job description connected to Jesus there in verse 1? It's not his surname. It's his job. Christ. Literally, my chosen 
saviour of the world. There are promises there that then work their way out in a pattern in history. Uh, I'm not going to read verses 2 to 17, but, uh, but there's a pattern there of generation to generation to generation. And the intent and purpose of God is consistent and constant. It's relenting and unwavering. It moves forward through every generation to this moment in time. And when you look at that genealogy, that family tree, you realise that all the names of the people reveal the heart of God. Not, Not just his promises, not just his stated intention, not just his persistence, but his heart. They're all outsiders. Oh, they look like insiders, but they're all outsiders. They're all outsiders because they're separated from God by what? By sin. And God says the best family tree for my boy is a family tree of sinners, a family tree full of adulterers and murderers and deceivers, a family tree full of those who abuse their power, A family tree full of liars. A family tree full of those who are abused, those who wander, those who damage and those who are damaged. And God says, they're all in my boy's family tree because that's my heart. My heart is to bring those who hate me back to me so that I can hang out with them forever. That's God's pattern. That's God's preparation for Christmas. It's a pretty unusual way to prepare, isn't it? (laughs) When you think about it. And it all comes to fruition in the birth of Jesus. I'm at point three on the outline. And again, so that we don't miss the point, look there in verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ, that word birth, there's that word Genesis again. The same word we had in chapter 1, verse 1. And there's that same job description. Did you see that? That, The genesis of Jesus Christ, just in case we missed it, that family tree of reprobates and sinners comes to this bloke. And it begins with a very human perspective. Look there in verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way after his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. It was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. From a human stance, Joseph is dealing with a fiancé who's pregnant in circumstances that are not all that clear. We know how that pans out in a small country town, don't we? The way gossip and rumour and innuendo flow around. But Joseph's not like that. There's something about Joseph. Joseph is different. And you notice that his desire is, I know know what has to be done, but I'm going to do it in a way that actually cares for the other person. Uh, Whatever else Matthew is doing here, He's pushing us as the readers to go, doesn't God work unusually? Doesn't God work with grace? Doesn't God work in an unexpected way to bring about his promises? Well, we then get God's view, don't we? Look there in verses 20 to 21. But after he considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son. You ought to name him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. Joseph just wanted a boy who'd be a carpenter. (laughs) Instead, he gets a child brought about by the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that, don't we? Are we giving a heads up as a readers? Do you notice that there in verse 18? We're actually told ahead of time, Joseph isn't. He has this dream and God says to him, I'm in control of this. The baby in the womb already got a name. Name is Jesus. Baby in the womb already got a clear origin. He's the result of the interest and intervention of God. Baby in the womb already got a job description. He's going to save his people from their sins. Baby in the womb, not unexpected. We knew that God would do something through Abraham's line and David's line and Joseph is in which line? David's line. This isn't a surprise to God and it shouldn't be a surprise to his people. But in case we don't quite grasp it, Matthew then gets us to look over our shoulder. 
to look backwards. Look there in verse 22. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant, give birth to a son. They'll name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, on face value, we know what that looks like. Don't we? It's very easy to grasp. God said something a very long time ago through a bloke called Isaiah who predicted that a virgin would get pregnant, give birth to a boy, that boy would be God himself. We know that, don't we? We've heard that time and time again. But I actually think there's a, a little bit more going on here, a little bit more than a prediction. Now let, me, let me tell you why I think there's a little bit more going on here. You see, the word used in Hebrew back in Isaiah 7, the original time when we look back over our shoulders, and we'll get there in a moment, the word used in Hebrew really just means a young woman who can give birth. Any young lady. Uh, Matthew chooses to translate it as virgin, a very different Greek word. Uh, when we go back to Isaiah, we're going to see that God says to Ahaz, hey, Ahaz, ask for a sign and I'll give you a sign and that sign will take place in your days right in front of you. As far as we know, no virgins gave birth in front of Ahaz. Something else is going on here. And when we go back to Isaiah, we'll actually work out that a little later, Isaiah has a whole brood of kids. <laughs> and God makes explicit connections between that sign and those kids. So whatever else is going on here, it's not just that Isaiah said, hey, let me have a stab in the dark and make a prediction. This is gonna, th there's something more going on here. So let's go quickly back to Isaiah chapter 7. If you've got your Bibles there, page 605 page 605, uh, I'll bring up a couple of the references or at least one up on the overhead, so don't stress. Uh, back to page 605. Isaiah, we're, we're talking about 700 years before Jesus, so a little bit of time. Isaiah is a bloke who God said, hey, Isaiah, go and speak to my people, Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, already, if you've been reading through Isaiah, you know that God's people are profoundly sinful, a bunch of of horrible hypocrites. Already we know that God goes, that's disgusting. I, I don't want you in my presence. Get away. Isaiah chapter 1. Already we know that God, as he says that, also says, but I desperately want to deal with your sin. And already we know in Isaiah 1 that God will do that by judging their sin and saving a small mob. A little group. And Isaiah's job is to proclaim that message and no one is going to listen to him. In the midst of all that, Isaiah chapter 7, God's mob are in a sticky situation. Their king is Ahaz. We're talking about people around Jerusalem. And the geopolitics of the region is now threatening his kingdom. Three nations to the north of gathered in an alliance, and they're about to attack him. And if you listen carefully to as Lyndon read, you, you would have heard in Isaiah 7 verse 2 that the heart of Ahaz and the hearts of his people trembled like trees of a forest shaking them. Where's God when we need him? Where's God when we need him? And Ahaz and his advisors start to negotiate with Assyria. A kind of like an AUKUS agreement, if you like. Getting the big powers on side to save them. And the Lord says to Isaiah, go and have a chat with Ahaz as he inspects the water sources getting ready for war. In Isaiah 7 verse 9, Ahaz is told, stand firm in your faith. The reassurance is to know that God hasn't walked out, that God's commitment and presence and clear desire is to save his mob, Isaiah 7, 3 to 9. The Lord says to Ahaz, just trust me, I am right by your side. Where is God? Right next to Ahaz. And then the Lord issues a remarkable invitation. It'll come up on the screen, Isaiah 7, 10 to 11. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. 
from the depths of Sheol to the heights of heaven. As far as I can work out, that is the only time God makes that invitation in all of the Bible. Can you imagine that? God comes to you and says, hey, just ask for a sign. I'll give you anything you want, just to reassure you. Ahaz takes it up, doesn't he? Ahaz is a boxhead. I couldn't dare ask for a sign, God. But God just offered a sign. Why hide behind false piety? Why hide behind an alliance with Assyria? God has clearly said, I want to give you a sign, Ahaz, that I am with you, you are not abandoned, I am committed. Ahaz says no way, and God says, well, bad luck, mate, you're going to get one. And that's the reading that we had. God will send a sign. A young woman will conceive and give birth to a son. Before that son has grown up, the threat of the alliance against Ahaz will be wiped out. But because of Ahaz and his people's persistent rebellion, God's going to actually bring judgment on them too. Assyria will come, Assyria will save them, and then Assyria will threaten them. And Ahaz doesn't listen, and God says, well, I'm bringing Babylon as well, and they're going to wipe you out. Out of that judgment, you will be saved. Just ask for a sign. The pattern of God hasn't changed, has it? That's God's pattern right throughout the Bible. The preparation of God hasn't changed. God wants to dwell with his mob and he'll do that by saving them in judging sin. Let me say that again. God wants to dwell with his mob and he'll do that by saving them through judgment and Ahaz watched it all unfold in front of him. The sign took place. Isaiah and his wife had a little child, a boy. Salvation came as Assyria emerged and wiped out that alliance and then came and surrounded Jerusalem so that Ahaz knew that what God said was true. And they continued to ignore God. God didn't ignore them and then God eventually brought Babylon and he judged them and their sin and took them away but didn't wipe them out. That's the pattern of God, the pattern of his preparation God is committed. God will do something about the sin that separates him from his mob. God will do that by judging sin. It is right throughout God's word. So when Matthew says, when Matthew says, this is the moment, that's what he's remembering. That's what he's remembering. That pattern of God being committed to his mob, judging sin so they are saved. It happens right across the Bible. There is a pattern here and here and here. And each time you see that pattern, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Similar historical circumstances, similar moments, similar doubts, same question, where is God, until it explodes at this moment with the biggest exhibition of that pattern in the whole of the Bible. Uh, And when you look back, and we're back in Matthew chapter 1, when you look back at what's going on when Jesus is born, it's so similar to Isaiah's day. Uh, There's the threatened rule of bigger powers, this time Rome. There's the hypocrisy and the surface-only religion of God's mob. There's a small group that are desperate to be faithful to God. There's a local king who's turned his back on God. There's a questioning by God's mob that is God really interested, just like in Isaiah 7. And then when you consider Matthew's account, we see that the pattern of God is there the pattern of his preparation from Abraham's mob, God will deal with sin. Through David's mob, God will create a king of eternal peace. God is focused. What does he say there in verse 21 of Matthew 1? He will save his people from their sins. He will remove the thing that stops God hanging out with his mob. Here is a climax of a pattern. A pattern that as Matthew looks over his shoulder, he sees right throughout God's word coming to this amazing escalation where God himself will come to deal with the sin that separates him from his mob. God will dwell with his people because Jesus will beat sin. And it happens. Look there in verse 24. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her. 
but he did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son and he named him Jesus. Just go look at the birth records. They're there. Bethlehem Town Hall. Go to the clerk. He'll dig them out. It actually took place. This massive escalation of God's pattern which he'd prepared for and the presence of God is now with his people. Each Christmas, I'm at the last point on the outline, each Christmas we have a pattern of preparation. As we said earlier, some start on Boxing Day, some start on Christmas Eve. But each year as we have a pattern of preparation, many of us hold on to the goodness of presence, don't we? Presence with each other, presence with those who are less fortunate, sometimes the pain of a lack of presence. It's part of what we do. In fact, that's actually the heart of Christmas, isn't it? Presence, the presence of God with his people, the presence of people with God, the removal of the very thing that stops that presence, the presence of sin. God himself has a history of preparation a pattern of dealing with this world that got everything ready for that first Christmas. I want to dwell with my mob. I'm going to achieve that by dealing with sin, bringing salvation through judgment, and that's what's going to happen with my boy Jesus. So as you get ready for Christmas, please consider these four truths very simply. Be reassured. History shows that God is not distant. Where is God? God is right here in this world. He took on flesh. He walked. He talked. He died. He rose. There is no reason to doubt this. There is no foundation for ignoring this. Be reassured. Be confronted. Second, the heart of Christmas is presence and it's the presence of God with his people dealing with human sin in Jesus. That's confronting because it actually reveals the true presence of Christmas, doesn't it? Is that the presence you obsess about? Is that the presence you spend time on and look forward to? Is that the presence you prepare for? That can be a little confronting because it actually reveals the real need of Christmas. The real need of Christmas is not perfect catering. It's not enough food. It's not a snooze on Boxing Day. The real need of Christmas is sin. And the need that each of us have for that being dealt with. Thirdly, be confronted. Whether we like it or not, God's come. (laughs) It's just happened, like he promised, like he prepared for. God has done exactly as he said, Jesus is real, our sin can be dealt with in him. Just like it's really hard to give back a Christmas present, you can't undo this presence. And so we've got to work out how to deal with it. This presence of God in our world, in Jesus Christ. But fourthly, Be reassured, be reassured. The reality of that past shows the truth of the future. Jesus is coming back and he will rule with unbelievable peace and restoration because he has dealt with human sin. There is nothing more certain, not even next Christmas. So let me finish with this question. What is your pattern of preparation for that day when God will be present with his people forever? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thank you that Matthew takes us back so we can look forwards. Thank you that you do not relent, you do not give up on your commitment to be present with your people, to deal with their sin through judgment that brings salvation. Thank you that that reaches its climax in Jesus. Father, reassure us, 
but also confront us of the real presence at Christmas. Amen.